How to fit reversing gear to a Stuart 5A steam engine, part 5. And in this episode I'm going to show how I made the engine run in both directions. Because as you can clearly see from the last episode, it will not run in reverse. There's a problem here. The eccentrics have been machined as one unit and I think the geometry must be wrong. Because normally it's not this difficult to get these engines to run. In this clip you will notice that the lever is in the down position. So now it's running OK in this direction as well. So thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. If only it was that simple. The only reason it's running in this direction is because I removed the eccentric strap, slackened off the grub screw and moved the eccentrics to a different position and now it runs in the opposite direction. And in this clip it's running quite well. It sounds OK. So have I fixed the problem? No. But I thought I'd let the engine run for a while, just to bed it in. Nothing's particularly tight on this engine, but the valve gear just needs a little bit of a run to smooth it out. So the problem is, the eccentrics are made as a pair. In this clip, you can clearly see that the eccentrics are not moving how they should be. So what's the solution? I could make two more eccentric sheaves as separate units, which is the way I always do it. Alternatively, I could use the externally adjustable eccentric that came with the engine which is what I'm going to do. To show how far out the timing is on this engine, I made a mark on the crankshaft, which corresponds to where the grub screw is on the eccentric sheave when the engine's running correctly in this direction. And just so I don't get confused, I'm drawing an arrow on the crankshaft to show the direction of rotation when the eccentric sheave's grub screw is on that line. I ran the engine to verify that this line was in the correct position, and then once again, just for a change, I removed the eccentric strap and readjusted the eccentric to make the engine go in the opposite direction. And I found that the eccentric sheaves were miles out, so here's my solution. In my right hand is the spare eccentric that came with the engine. And in my left hand is all that's left of the double eccentric once I machine most of the other eccentric away in the lathe. Over now to the milling machine and it's time to mill away part of the flange. I need to do this because I'm going to drill a hole at this point which will be tapping size for 4BA and I'm going to fit a 4BA grub screw. So why did I do it this way? Why didn't I keep the eccentric that already had the grub screw in it? Well, it was in the wrong place. It was at one side of the central flange. I need the grub screw to be in the middle of the eccentric sheave so that I can drill a hole in the eccentric strap underneath to allow the Allen key in to adjust the grub screw without removing the eccentric strap. After removing part of the flange with a small milling cutter, I followed the usual procedure of centre drill, followed by tapping size drill, and here I'm threading the hole using a 4BA tap. I'm using the tap in the milling machine to make sure that it enters the hole squarely. And in this clip I'm drilling a hole in the underneath part of the eccentric strap, and this will allow me to adjust the eccentric sheave whilst everything is in position. You need to have plenty of patience for working with small steam engines. Thankfully, owing to some events in my childhood, I have plenty of patience. When I was a kid, I had a model railway in my playroom. And occasionally my father would appear and point out that such and such a locomotive wasn't running very well. So he would start to dismantle the engine to fix the problem, which was usually brushes. And the brushes are very fiddly, so when he got to the part where he was removing the brushes, the spring would fly off and then he would spend quite a bit of time looking for that on the floor. Then he'd drop some more small parts. And very quickly his patience would run out entirely. And often it would throw the engine across the room. But when he'd gone, I would pick up the engine and put it back together and fix it. But without losing patience. Because seeing my father getting really exasperated by a job used to make me think, well, I don't think that's the way to do it. I was lucky I had parents who taught me a lot. Most of the time intentionally, but occasionally I was shown how not to do a job by my father. Don't get me wrong on this, I had the utmost respect for my father and loved him dearly and miss him to this day. Now everything's together, I can adjust the eccentric sheaves with ease without removing any parts. This initial adjustment is wrong, the engine's far too advanced but now I don't have to take off the eccentric strap, which makes it a lot easier. And eventually, after two or three attempts, I get the engine to run how it's supposed to, 
without throwing it across the room. These are just the initial rough adjustments. When the camera's turned off, I will go into obsess mode and attempt to adjust the timing so the engine runs very well in both directions. I showed in a previous episode how to position the slide valve inside the steam chest on the valve rod. I'll be double checking this because the steam chest cover has to come off, it needs a gasket. But I'd just like to post a health and safety warning. Normally when adjusting the valve timing on a steam engine, I would normally connect my compressed air line and put some air into the engine, so I can hear when it is admitted and exhausted from the cylinder. You can get a nasty nip from small steam engines, but on an engine of this size, it's positively dangerous. Always make sure that you only admit sufficient compressed air to hear the noise it makes. If you allow too much compressed air into the engine, the engine will try and start, and you will possibly break your fingers. A good rule of thumb, no pun intended, is that you need to be stronger than the engine. If you're struggling to hold the flywheel back as you rotate it while you test it like this, there's a good chance that you're going to get your thumb caught up in the works if the flywheel revolves suddenly and takes you by surprise. And after that dire warning, I think that's about it for this video. In fact, that's it for this particular series. Although you will see this engine again because I'm going to fit a mechanical lubricator and also a separate manual oil pump to lubricate the crosshead. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.